Hello, and thank you for joining us to talk about ed prep policies during COVID-19. We know that there's many choices and uncertainty right now, so we're going to present this to you in a way that we think will be familiar. This is a choose your own adventure tale. I'm Emily Bogus, Regional Manager of Regulatory Affairs for Western Governors University, and I have my colleague Verna here. I am Verna Lowe, Senior Manager of Academic Engagement and Compliance for Educator Preparation. And our story today is dedicated to all the children learning. They are the reason we are here, and they are who we need to keep in mind when making policy decisions. So a little bit about WGU. Verna, do you want to give them an overview? Yes, just a little context about WGU. Um, <clears throat> WGU is a private nonprofit institution that was founded uh, by 19 Western governors. It has, in a little over 20 years, has risen to 124,000 students with an amazing uh, alumni of over 200,000 students. In particular, Teachers College has 20, over 29,000 students and 15 initial and 17 advanced licensure programs. We're all competency-based and fully online. One of the things for the context of this presentation is, is that this past spring, when COVID hit, we had over 1,900 students across 50 states in student teaching. And so these are lessons learned uh, from this experience. Thank you, Verna. So we'll get into chapter one here, the United States in 2020. And as Verna mentioned, we're in a national university and we have students in all states. So when COVID hit, we had to look at policies across all the states. And what did we track? Well, quite a few things. You can see there's a lot of variables here that impacted educator preparation. And we continue to track this since COVID is ongoing. So we'll talk now about some challenges in education that are impacted by COVID, particularly the achievement gap. Verna, if you want to um, just let things go and hope our students will be okay, we can go to page eight. But if you want to take a closer look at which students it will most impact, we can turn to page nine. What would you like to do? Well, let's just first see what happens if it we let it run its course. Okay. Oh, okay, so here is a forecast for learning loss in reading. And here it is for mathematics. So you can see that these are very concerning projections. Um, they show a very uh, widening achievement gap due to COVID. So we turn back a page and let's just go look at what students it will impact the most. And this data comes from a study from McKinsey and Company and it shows months of learning loss. And you can see that the achievement gap is worse for self-identified non-white and low-income students. And we know research has showed us that students have better learning outcomes if they're matched to a same race teacher at least once. So then we can, again, let things run its course, or we can look at the barriers to workforce diversity. What would you like Let's to do? Let's go ahead and look at those barriers. All right, good Let's idea. Look at so the barriers. Mm -hmm. exam pass rates are a major barrier to workforce diversity. This is data from the CSET, the California exams, and you can see here the annual pass rate and the self-identified white race um, candidates are passing at a much higher rate. But this is not just true in California. This is data from the Praxis 1 basic skills exam and also from Praxis 2. You can see these same trends of passage rates across the country. So Verna, we have another choice here. Do you wanna look at California's work in exam bias or do you wanna look at another contributing factor to the COVID slide? Well, let's first look at California's work on exam okay. bias. Great. We'll just highlight three important initiatives. California has annual reporting of their passage rates. They created an examination bias review committee and they've worked on Senate Bill 614. Now, unfortunately, this bill did not pass this session, but it did have the support of the commission. And so we expect to see that um, something 
like that in the next session. Okay, so then let's continue on to look at another contributing factor to the COVID slide. And Verna, I'll let you take this one. Well, what the teacher shortages have been reported across the 50 states and increasing at a rapid rate due to COVID. And these are just snapshots to serve as exemplars of what we're seeing across all 50 states. Uh, one of our surprises has been Washington. We never, we just received this information in just the last several weeks that one of their top shortages is elementary education. And we really never thought that that would occur, at least not in my era. Uh, when you look at Utah and New York, you'll see that there are some uh, pretty astounding retirements. And this tends to be a, a pattern that we're seeing actually in other states as well. A more disheartening poll uh, states that one in five teachers are not returning to the profession. And what saddens us is that eliminates uh, a whole group of prepared workforce. And just the time when we need a prepared workforce, when uh, the different policies to operate during COVID may require additional staff, we're also losing teachers at the same time. So we are very concerned about having a prepared workforce. Right, so we've decided that two important factors to closing the achievement gap may be increasing workforce diversity and maintaining a prepared teacher pipeline. Bernard, would you like to go ahead and look at how emergency COVID-19 policies may help close the achievement gap? Absolutely, Emily. <laughs> We'll get into chapter three and into our policy review. These cover clinical experiences. What you're looking at here is a map of states who have responded and created options for COVID. If you'll look at uh, several states that we have here to show you that uh, the yellow states are the ones who have reduced clinical experience hours and offered other alternatives. Some surprising states have been for us that we didn't believe we would see is Texas. Texas is a state that's not known for great flexibility and they decreased clinical hours and um, offered virtual experiences. Indiana was another state that provided uh, some options related to student teaching experience and they were uh, ones who have multiple times have collected information on how many they can have in the as a prepared workforce. I think we're now looking at the blue states. And when we look at the blue states, they have shortened some student teaching hours, um, but they also allow for student teaching to occur virtually or through a, some type of alternative experience. And then we have the red states and no policies were really created for them for clinical placement flexibility. However, here at WGU, we tried to make sure that our candidates stayed in their student teaching placement and could continue to work with school districts with whatever option they were doing. And um, even though in light of these kinds of policies. That's right. And it's in line with what California has done. Um, California did not shorten their clinical experience hours, but they encouraged students to complete the full experience. But for those who are unable to, they offer a variable term waiver for candidates who need extra time to complete their field experiences. And then we've been watching states recently who are making and not making policies yet for this academic year. The ones that are all striped there are states that we are still looking to see make policies for the 2021 academic year. All right, we're on a choice. Um, Verna, do you want to look at COVID-19 policies in exams and licensure, or are you a little overwhelmed and need a quick break? Oh, well, a quick break works for me. <laughs> Great, I do like to take breaks. So this, uh, these photos went viral a week ago. Um, this is a family of Shiba Inus in Hong Kong, and the one with the back to us, her name is Hina, and she's notorious for ruining group photos. So we'll just take a quick look at a few of her photos. <laughs> She's just the cutest. <laughs> <laughs> All 
I'm I feeling like a little that. bit better. <laughs> yeah. You ready to move on then? I certainly am, Emily. All right. So we're going to look at um, COVID-19 policies in licensure exams and temporary licenses. Uh, first, we have green states and red states. And if we look at the red states, um, these were states who had current policies that would uh, e easily accommodate COVID. And so an example has been Montana, who had a provisional license. And so students could still be licensed by having a bachelor's degree and being enrolled in an EPP. And so that met the requirement. New York created an emergency COVID-19 certificate, and it was basically for completers who were unable to take their New York exams. And then Minnesota uh, has created a, a different license and enacted that. And that was also for the very same reason for candidates who uh, needed a reprieve because they weren't able to take their exams. And then Washington. Washington uh, gets a star because they reacted very quickly to COVID. It, and uh, they created emergency policies in March 2020, and it was related to program completers who were unable to take their exams. All of this effort was designed to have a prepared workforce. And of course, looking into California. Now, California already had the preliminary credential, but because of COVID, they changed, expanded the rules a little bit. Um, to allow candidates that were unable to complete the exams to be eligible for the preliminary credential and move those exam requirements to the clear credential. And uh, this was recently extended for the academic year 2021 from uh, Senate Bill 820, which was passed just a week ago as of recording. All right, so now we're going to talk a little bit about lessons learned. And we'll go back to this image we had of increasing workforce diversity and maintaining a prepared teacher pipeline, how those can help close the achievement gap. And I'll let Verna tell you about some of these lessons learned. We certainly have learned many lessons and we are still on a sharp learning curve. And based on the current national status, this is one of the greatest crises that we are facing, but the greatest impact is on closing the achievement gap, which may end up being a generation gap for the this group of P-12 students. So we have to have a multifocal um, type of approach to tackle this problem. And one of the most important things is to have um, and maintain a prepared workforce, particularly as it relates to having um, meet the needs of our diverse population of students. We know that it's important to have national standards and many EPP programs are designed around national and content specialty standards. And this is very important and it becomes even more important uh, in program design for our future. It also will be important for institutions to have multiple measures to assure competency. What we learned from COVID-19 was that without licensure exams, uh, states relied on EPPs that have additional measures of competency to assure teaching performance and that uh, their performance would impact positively student achievement. Uh, for us at Western Governors, we're a competency-based institution and we have all of our programs that are aligned to competencies that must be passed in order to even accomplish the degree or even to enter into student teaching. And so uh, we have many performances that students have to run through, very similar to what I'm sure you all have as well. And this was a way that we had to assure the competency of the candidate in the face of not having uh, certain specific licensure exams available to us. The other thing is, is that I think this is going to change what we off offer in ed preparation programs, because as we continue to work through this and candidates are uh, doing actual virtual student teaching, it's going to be more imperative that we actually prepare candidates on um, how to teach remotely and, and virtually for instruction. So that will be another change coming for us. I, I think another piece uh, that we have to look 
uh, for is the flexibility in licensure and to come up with some additional licensure options. And I think that this is going to be very important to reduce teacher shortages, to maintain a diverse workforce, and particularly a highly prepared uh, workforce. Observed across the nation is um, assuring the teacher candidates, candidacies and teaching and taking, uh, being sure that they can acquire their license if we don't have those teacher uh, exams. However, what I think is more important to understand is piece, this, uh, is the teacher licensure mobility issue or immobility issue. As we serve 50 states, we see this greatly that we could actually reduce the teacher shortage, have a greater diverse workforce if we had greater mobility across and between states. Right now, many times candidates who may be licensed from an approved program in a, in a regionally accredited institution and have already taken a set of licensure exams uh, may not be able to transfer that directly to a state. They may have other additional course requirements, other exam requirements, a number of pieces that they would have to meet, which delays them entering the workforce, even though they have been prepared as a teacher in an approved program and often a nationally accredited program. And so one of the things that we are encouraging is a greater collaboration on the issue of licensure mobility so that we can continue to assure a prepared workforce and close the achievement gap. And so would it be possible in collaboration that states could agree to accept uh, the processes of state exams and the possibility of those approved programs in other states as a way to at least enter the workforce in a particular state. And then uh, over time, those additional requirements may be met. I do know that some states already allow for that, but we are certainly encouraging that. And there, these are the observations we've made to this point, but it's because we deeply care first about our nation's P-12 children and youth, and second, because we care about the quality of our profession. So we are gonna continue at WGU to con conduct 50 state research and observations uh, related to this. So stay tuned, we'll have more to tell you soon. Yes, thank you. These are the things that keep us up at night. <laughs> Congratulations, you reached the end of the adventure. We're so glad you could join us. We hope we gave you some tools and information when considering policy decisions. And so now it's your turn to go create your own adventure. If you have any questions, feel free to contact us at our email addresses. And thank you again. Thank you.